what I really want you to take away from this is that you, as the leader of change, whether you are leading um, a vol you could be leading a volunteer organization, you could be leading a whole company. I know, you know, we have some CEOs and vice presidents here. Uh, and presidents, you could be leading a department. There's many ways that you lead. And when it comes to change, we know that most organizations today are going through change. And if you're not, if your organization is not going through change, it probably should be. And I'll tell you why in just a second. You'll see what I mean. And so what we're going to be doing here to, today is we're going to be looking at these key concepts. The first one is leader bias toward change. Now, I'm not able to do that here but um, it, because we're, we're virtual. But when I do a change workshop and I actually have people in the room, as soon as they get settled in, I say, okay, I want everybody to get up. I want you to take all your things and I want you to switch seats. And as you can imagine, people kind of, oh, do we have to? And they drag their feet and they complain about it. But I do that on purpose because if you complain about something as simple as changing your seat, you can imagine how hard change is for many people. You know, there's an old joke about psychologists, and I don't know if you've heard this joke. And am I speaking slowly enough and clearly enough? Icha, am I speaking slowly and clearly enough? Yeah? Very clear. Very clear. Yeah. Okay. Very clear. There's an old joke about psychologists, and it goes like this. How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> well, it only takes one but the light bulb has to really want to change, <laughs> okay? So change in organizations, it can only take one leader, but you have got to be the right leader for change, okay? We're gonna be talking about uh, what's the difference between managing change and leading change. We'll talk about that. I'm gonna talk about mistakes made by change leaders about behaviors of successful change agents and how you can be an instrument of seismic change. Now, I know this is being uh, videotaped, this is being recorded. And so will they have access to this afterwards, Gatot? Yes. 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 Okay, so you'll have um, access to this afterwards and you can also feel free to share the slides with them. You can share the deck. If anybody wants the deck, they can have it because I don't want you to feel as if you have to be taking um, copious notes. I see, her, I see Rini there taking notes. She, she was always a note taker. So I don't want you to feel like you'll miss anything. Okay, so those are our key concepts. You know, so many of us think of changing the world as... Uh, you know, as Gatot so nicely said, I'm proud of many, my many accomplishments, but uh, none so much as having ch created two nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. because I'm like everybody else, right? I think about changing the world, but I'm also like everybody else and no one thinks of changing themselves. <laughs> and when it comes to organizational change, you're going to hear me keep going back to this. It starts with you and you may have to change yourself. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say most of you, probably not all of you, but most of you have to change yourself if you are to be a successful change agent. Before we got started, before we, we let everybody into the room, we, we were talking about um, the ways in which especially some lower level people in Indonesia fail to speak up, fail to challenge the status quo. And I said, you know, when I was brought there, oh gosh, now it's been 20, 30, over 30 years ago, the first time to train people. And some of you were in those training programs. My, my, I was charged with helping Indonesian nationals to speak up right? And speak up to authority. And even all these years later, for some people, that's hard. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be a change agent, you have to find your voice. You have to be willing to say things that other people may not be willing to say. And so we're going to, so we start right there. Okay. Can, now, can I, can I yeah. uh, say something, guys? Please. 
people are afraid to say something because their leaders is not giving a chance for them to speak up. Uh, that's a good okay. point, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that it goes both ways. People yeah. are afraid to speak up because their leaders don't give them a chance. And then sometimes when the leader gives them a chance, the leader slaps them down. Yes. So then, they, so then they're afraid to speak up because in your culture, and we were talking about it, how the, the uh, ego of the leader can be so important, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, most of you grew up uh, under um, uh, Soharto, mm -hmm. right? You grew up under Soharto, who was a military leader. And he ran the country like a military leader. And that was your vision of leadership. And so if that's your vision of leadership, that you have to lead like Soharto, you're not going to be able to do it because it doesn't work in 2021 and beyond. Um, that kind of leadership, that top-down leadership is dead. Mm. It's dead. You know, when, and many of you know, I worked for ARCO at ARCO in Los Angeles for many years. And when I would, when my boss would say jump, I would say how high. Now, if you have a 25 year old working with you today, let me ask Nico this question. You have a 25 year old working with you today and you say jump, what does that 25 year old say? Why? They don't say hi. No, no, they say why, why do I have They to say why, <laughs> exactly. They say why, they don't say how high. And that's because they don't respond to top-down leadership. They don't respond to authoritative leadership. And I know Gatot and the three coaches have talked to you about emotional intelligence, and I'll be talking about it a little bit, a little bit later. Um, that's why that's so important, that emotional intelligence, because your emotional intelligence is more important to your ability to lead, your EQ, than your IQ. Because we've all seen really smart people at the top of organizations, haven't we? We have all seen really smart people and we've seen them fail. And we've seen them fail, not because they're not smart, not because they don't work hard, because they don't have a high EQ. And we'll be talking about that. Okay, so thank you for bringing that up, Icha. Okay, now some, let's talk about some leader challenges. Now, those of you who've worked with me before, you've seen these little, these little uh, figures before. I know you've seen them. So the one on the left is a square. The one, the next one is a circle. The next one is a triangle. And the next one is a squiggly line. And what I want you to do is I want you to pick the one that speaks to you most. Okay, the, you'll, you'll narrow it down quickly to two, but then just pick one that really speaks to you, okay? So everybody should have a shape in mind that you say, this is the shape that speaks to me. Okay, very, very loosely, these are related to the Myers-Briggs, mm. okay? And the Myers-Briggs tells us what our preferences are, what our communication preferences are. And as much as our preferences can be strengths, they can be challenges, particularly when it comes to change. So let's just look at, the square to start with, okay, uh, what, here we go, okay, and when we think about the square, we think, if you are a square, you are somebody who we would call a thinker, you are data-driven, you are logical, you're systems-oriented, and you focus on fairness, okay, what's the fair thing to do? Now, that's different from what's the right thing to do, right? Fair and right are two different things. I'm just curious, how many people chose the square? Um, I don't, maybe you could put it in the chat box mm -hmm. and then somebody could tell, you know, I, I don't have my chat box up right now, but you know, t if you chose the square, just say I did and put it in the chat box and then maybe somebody can tell me how many people chose the square. Did anybody choose the square? Not yet. Glenn yeah, I, circle and then Rini uh, squiggly line. No, no, don't tell me. No, don't tell me. Just the square. Just the square. Just the square. None. None? None yet. You know, that's interesting because whenever I'd go to Indonesia to do training, it, 
you'd only get the squares from the engineers, right? I, I don't know how many engineers are on the line right here, but you got the you got the squares from the engineers often. Okay, so but if you're a square, I like okay, a demonare is square. I I used to be circle, but now I was like ten to square. Maybe the type of work that I do here now is more working with data. Exactly, Ade. It's not so much that our personality changes, but our behavior changes depending on the job. So Ade, if you're working with data, that's probably why the square appeals to you now. But if I, but if I were to take a guess, and there, I know there's nobody from your company on this call, but if I would no. take a guess, it's also not your favorite thing to do, right? No, no. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and so that's also how you know if that's your true style or not. Because if you oh, that was oh, Sri Hagen just joined us. Hello, He's, Sri Hagen. Hi, Doris. Sorry, hi. sorry for being late. Uh, that's okay. We're glad you're here. Okay, so, and I'm going to talk about what the challenges are for each type, but let me explain what each type is first. Okay, then the circle, we refer to them as a feeler. And what do they value? They value tradition, the culture, they value people, how their decisions are going to impact others, and they want to make sure that they're inclusive. Okay, now you often see these people in consulting roles, you see them in human resources, right? You see them in helping fields. How many people chose the circle? If you chose the circle, just type in circle in the chat so we can count how many circles we have, okay? Now, while you're doing that, if you look at the circle and the square, you can see what some of the challenges already are. Because look at the sharp edges on the square. Look at the soft edges on the circle. It's nine. Right? So when you nine, put... Nine. Nine there's plus, nine, plus me. Nine, so pl with me. Nine, nine plus you, you said? Yeah. Nine nine plus, plus, ten, ten plus ten. me. Ten plus you plus me is 11. <laughs> so look, I don't know how many people are on the call, but about half the people on this call are, are feelers right? That this is what they value. And that's not a bad thing for change management, but it's not the only thing. So we have to be careful because when the square looks at the circle, the square says, oh, you're too touchy-feely. Oh, you know, you're not logical enough. But the circle looks at the square and says, oh, you have sharp edges. You don't care about people. You only care about the bottom line. Okay, so again, think about who you are and how you may have to complement your greatest strengths. All right, the triangle we would call the sensor. All right, and again, very loosely related to the Myers Briggs. Obviously, I don't have time to do the Myers Briggs with you, um, but the sensor is action oriented, bottom line oriented. Their motto is ready, fire, aim. They want measurable results. They want tangible results. Is that a bad thing? Absolutely not. Is that the only thing? Absolutely not. And so you can see now when, you know, a sensor looks at a, a feeler, right? When the triangle looks at the circle, they say, this is taking too long. Why do we have to get everybody's opinion? And the circle is looking at the triangle and saying, because if we don't, we're not going to be able to move forward with everybody on board. So again, you need to have all types on your teams and you need to understand what your personal challenges might be. And finally, uh, let's look over here. Let me just move this. Oh, and finally, yeah. over here, we have the intuitor. Okay. And the, the squiggly line. Oh, oh, how many sensors do we have? If you can type in sensor. Uh, you're a sensor, Rini? Yep. Well, now I think I am a sensor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Based on my work. <laughs> okay. Matty also? Matty? Yes. Matty, I would say, knowing her, she is a sensor. Matty, I think you used to be maybe just a thinker. I think you added in the sensor a little bit. Um, any other sensors? Six, uh, uh intuitor, not sensors, intuitor. No, so I'm, on, I'm on sensor right now. Oh, okay. Uh, Amri, where are you? Which one are you? 
Um, Amri is in Twitter. Uh, Amri is. Well, look, I, I honestly, honestly, uh, at the beginning, I thought between the uh, the two whites, the circle or uh, the uh, squiggly squiggly line. Oh, okay. But I think when I think, ah, well, yeah, I, I, I think I, I don't know. I just think about me is is this. Although to be honest, Lois, I, I feel myself. Uh, you know me like long time ago, right? And and today. I think I adjusted a lot. When you talk about that MBTIs, I adjusted a lot uh, just to aligning with the what I said, the requirement for the job. So, you know, so so that's how I equip myself. But if you ask me again, when you talk about MBTI, right, some years ago, I still think MBTI is what you said is your preference. So, so the preference, uh, I think preference will not change, but, but, but I, uh, you know, I took this step to adjust, uh, what do you call it, with, with apa? sadar to apa to? With, uh, Aware. Awareness. Yeah. Concise, concise. Yeah, Con concise. I, I, yeah, thank you. I took this, uh, you know, concise decisions to adjust it so I can deliver effectively in my job. I have some okay. colleagues here, maybe they can comment about that later on, but, you know, because... Uh, rules or you know, all of that, you need to add it to the uh, to to equip you in the to deliver effectively. I think that's how I say it. Okay, yeah, and our behaviors change, like you said. Your preferences don't change, but mm. your behave behaviors change, just as Ade suggested. Okay, so but now for Intuitor Squiggly Line, these are people who value being on the cutting edge of things. They're very creative. They're usually ahead of the curve. Um, and they look at long range goals. Okay, it's not about the immediate. It's about down the road. <laughs> what would this look like? So, Rini, you said you're an intuitor. Yep. Okay. Any other intuitors? They're usually the ones that are the fewest in any group. Um, in my case, I think I also change, uh, just like Amri is. I used to be a circle. I think when I was still in HR. Uh, but now that I uh, deal with my grandchildren, most of the time working at home, being a, a, a good nanny uh, in a way, a good uh, 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 pendamping um, uh, to them, to my two grandchildren, I think I, I'm more towards the sweet good line because I need, I'm adapting to seeing people differently. Uh, there's beauty in every irregularity, so to speak. Okay, and you need to be more creative. Yeah. All right. Well, were there any? Yeah. Did someone say something? No, I thought I heard I someone say Lois. No? I, okay. I, I want, I, let me ask you, uh, Lois, that when I look at this, I, I think, you know, probably my, uh, I tilted towards um, the feeler in the beginning, but for some reasons, um, it, it, it looks like myself when i'm doing this it becomes like a combinations of even the the, <clears throat> the i become the the square and under pressure i will become the sensor you know like aiming for this so <clears throat> it's it's um, but looking at this uh, the mbti it's uh, i don't know it's not that i have a split personality <laughs> no <laughs> but it is it is something <laughs> along that line you know like you probably dominant probably looks like it is in the circle but i i change i i change to to censor you know like under pressure that's why people said sometimes nico can be very effective and become better when he's totally under pressure okay absolutely and actually you know you bring up something that's really important we all have parts of these in us it's what it's what we prefer and then the good leader right? The effective leader knows about all of these and when to apply which. So when you're under pressure, you go, I get going, right? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that's what you're saying. And the same thing when Ade says, you know, I'm really a feeler, but my job is requiring me to do these other things that are under the square. Well, yeah, under pressure, that's what she has to do. Okay, so you're absolutely right. But the good leader really says, well, I have all of these in me and I need to know when I should use each. So, so let me move on and show you. Uh, okay, so then what are the challenges? What are the, cha 
Yeah, did somebody say something? No? Okay, I thought I heard something. Um, what are the challenges for each of these types? So for, if you are a square, you need to be careful because you can get caught up in analysis paralysis, right? You'll never have enough data to make a decision. You'll never enough, have enough data to say the cha this change direction is the right way to go. And you may be insensitive to human needs when it comes to change. And what you have to remember, you know, John Cotter wrote a book called The Heart of Change. It's a wonderful book. And much of what I'm going to talk to you about today comes from his book, The Heart of Change. And so what he says is that we have to engage people's hearts. And the square at times has a little bit of difficulty doing that. So if you're a square, that's going to be one of your challenges. If you are a circle, okay, if you're a feeler, you may be too, you may be risk avoidant, right? Because you don't want to make anybody unhappy. You don't want to offend anybody. And you may be too consensus, consensus driven. It's important to get consensus, but it's important to also understand consens consensus doesn't mean that everybody agrees with this new direction. There will always be people who don't agree with it. Let me give you a, a quote from Machiavelli in just a second. Okay, so those may be your challenges, in which case you need to overcome those. If you're a censor, you may not be planful or strategic enough because you just want to get to the bottom line. I just want to make this change happen. Let's get this change going. Let's make it happen. That's not how change happens. It doesn't happen because you will it. It happens because of all these other things I'm going to talk about. And you may step on people's toes, okay, because you don't include the people who need to be included. And finally, the, for the intuitors, um, what, why is this not moving? There we go. You know, remember the intuitors always want to be on the cutting edge of things. So at times, intuitors may be unrealistic about how long the change is going to take, what kind of change would be acceptable, um, unrealistic about how many people you need to get involved. So the intuitor may be unrealistic and unable, it says unable to exe executive, but that should be unable to execute. That's a typo, it should be unable to execute. And you may be unable to execute because intuitors are often like thinkers. They have a lot of the same characteristics of thinkers, so they like the data and so forth, but they like to apply it in a creative, forward-thinking way. That's the difference. So these may be some of your leader challenges, and you need to think about, based on your type, what are your challenges? Uh, let me just stop there for a second, see if there's any questions before I move on. Are there any questions? Okay, nope. can I ask, uh, Luis? Uh, I have been hearing that uh, participants here like uh, Amri or maybe uh, Rini mentioning about between sensor and Twitter. While myself, at first you displayed this slide, I definitely, definitely only choose one circle and I don't want to see any other shape. And when you explain about this is about filler, it really matches with what I feel about it. And uh, it really what I thought, uh, because circle to me is like commitment. Uh, when you say something, you uh, make a schedule of something, you have to make it happen. For example, this today, 26 uh, March, we have uh, promised to you 26 uh, March, nine o'clock. There is no way we reschedule it. It's a commitment for me, circle. My question is, is that normal? Because some people here mentioning about, yeah, between square and circle, between circle and triangle, and between triangle and uh, squid uh, line, uh, which, which one actually is true? <laughs> you know what? It's all true, Katona. I don't want to sound wishy-washy. I don't want to sound basa basi. But the fact is, is that it's all true. Now, when you say you chose the circle, but you know, you're when you commit to something, you commit to it. But what you are really committing to is people, right? 
that's really what it's about. You don't make the change because you don't want to let people down. That's part of that feeler part of you. So that makes total sense to me. And also when you say, you know, I don't even, you know, the other ones don't even appeal to me. That just means you're a really strong circle. You're a really strong feeler. And it's going to be more challenging for you to add in these other behaviors. I, I can tell you that I feel that way about the square. Okay. Like, you know, I don't have much, I don't have much square in me. Okay. Um, and so I have to force myself to look at the data, to make logical decisions and not make them from the heart, not make them from my value system. And so that just makes it all the harder for me. Okay, but it's but it's true what you're saying. You can have someone who's just one type, but you always have a little bit of this other in you, or you could not be successful. Gatot, you could not have your own business and not have some of these other things in you. It's just a strong preference. Okay, mm. does that make sense? Yeah, this makes sense because when you ask uh, ask for, about choosing from four to three or two two, I uh, the first time you said I just point out into only circle. I didn't <laughs> consider anything else, only circle, because I love circle very much. Yeah, because you love people so much. And that's what makes you good at what you do. Right? Now, you probably could not do Ade's job. I would bet you could not do Ade's job. Because Ade has to do the th you know, add in the thinker behavior. If you were in that job, you would be absolutely miserable. Miserable. Okay. Lois, Lois can I give a comment? And then, yeah. I'm really Lois. Now, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, I, I said I adjusted my, you know, my uh, behaviors, if you will, right, in accordance to these four areas or MBTIs. But the longer time you do it, what I felt, what I felt, it became like automatic. So it's not like, you know, if, if I still remember as well that, you know, how you charge your energy, for instance, like as you said, it's an introvert, extrovert, or the, you know, uh, so on. So I, I don't feel that I need that big of energy anymore. Even I use like uh, not my preference style. Uh, in my position, for instance, now, yes, I need to balance between feeler, for instance, but also the thinker and sensor. Either, otherwise, as you said, you cannot make that change. You cannot drive the organization. So sometimes you have to push the, uh, or balance, I would say, balance between the feeler and thinker. And sometimes you have to make tough decisions that will not be a popular you know, decision. It's, it's more difficult to do it in the past, to be honest, like 20, 30 years ago. Uh, today, no, I can see the bigger business picture and, and aim. And then if I have to do that for the, you know, for the good of a wider organization, then I just do it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I you have developed that. complementary skills over the course of your career. You have gotten so much feedback. I am sure you have gotten so much feedback about the behaviors you have to add to be successful. On top of that, you are intuitive, right? You're just intuitive about what do I have to do to be successful here? And you're able to kind of shift. Not everybody can do that. Not all of us can do that. I mean, Gato just told you. I don't even want to look at any of the other shapes. Mm -hmm. I only want to look at the circle. And he's in the right job for that, right? And you're in the right job for being able to look across and say what has to be applied. Mm -hmm. And also, let me just say that, you know, the Myers-Briggs is a much more robust uh, measure. This is just to give you an idea, a small idea of what you need to think about. Okay. All right. Let me move. So yeah. To say Thank you, Luis. Can I? Yeah. yeah. Who is speaking? Is that Metty? Metty, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm a sensor here, yeah, even though in the past I'm more a thinker, yeah, but now become more sensor. But when you explain about that in Twitter with the unrealistic is one thing that you need to be careful, yeah. You know what? It's not always negative, the unrealistic. These days, in my work, in the last one month, 
I wish I can be more unrealistic. You know what? I am working with uh, my team now, helping the government to make the investor coming to Indonesia, and it needs a big change. So we talk and talk every day. And one thing that I realize why Indonesia is behind compared with the other country because they're always thinking about need to be realistic, need to be realistic. So they put themselves in a box. This is what realistic means. So I wish, now let's talk about unrealistic and find a way later to go there. Um, I'm glad you said that because if we were to go back, okay, and look at this, right? So the uh, at their best, the squiggle lines are on the cutting edge, right? They're ahead of the curve. They're creative. So this is what you're saying is necessary, right? If we want to be competitive, then this is what's necessary. Isn't that what you're saying? We need to take a creative approach. We need to look at long range goals that may not be realistic. Isn't that what you're saying? Yeah, yes, that's what I'm saying. But uh, what I mean is do not box us in the realistic sometimes. Uh, for instance, for instance, the startup industry. When it started, it wasn't, and uh, it wasn't realistic. It just well, could you say that? Could you say that again? When what started? The startup and uh, the startup industry, like the Gojek or Grab or okay, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. But when it started, it wasn't realistic. It's right. weird. It won't last long. But now it becomes something that very helpful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, yes. Yeah, that, that, that's just my comment about unrealistic. I just want to say that nowadays, I'm thinking about how to become unrealistic and then find a way to get there. Well, you know what? Joel Barker was a futurist. And Joel Barker used to say, we all have to, as leaders, we all have to ask the paradigm question, which is what is not currently being done that if we did it would fundamentally change how we do business, would fundamentally change the world, would, would fundamentally change things. And I think that's what you're saying too, is that we need to think of things that are unrealistic in the moment and they're not being done because people think it's, it's too far out there, right? I mean, I remember when I was a little girl and I used to read Dick Tracy comic books and Dick Tracy had something on his wrist that was a watch that he talked into. Now this was in the 1950s, okay? It was the 1950s. And Dick Tracy in the comic book had a watch that he talked into. And we all said, whoa, you know, that's so far out. That's unrealistic. Nobody's gonna talk into a watch and look at today, right? Everybody's talking into their watches. So you're absolutely right, Manti. You're absolutely right. Thank you for bringing that up. One, okay. One more yeah. question, Lois. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, with uh, when you are get, getting older, do you think that it's going to ch change the type? You know, it, not so much because so much. the the theory is that our preferences are developed very early in childhood, like with the Myers-Briggs. They mm -hmm. say that your preferences de develop by the time you're two or three years old. Okay, and then it's a combination of nurture and nature. So, you know, again, I, I don't think our preferences change that much over time. All right, okay. It may be that over time, you're allowed to do more of what you want, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like, like, for example, the two that I always kind of gravitate to is the circle for sure, but also the squiggly line. But when I worked at Arco, the squiggly line wasn't valued. So I wasn't allowed to do that. Right. And so how could that be developed? But then when I left Arco and I started my own business and I could do whatever I wanted, then some of those behaviors could come out. So it's not so much that the that the preference changes, but that circumstances allow our behaviors to change. Does that make sense? 
Yes, that was me. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, let me move on. Um, you need to determine your readiness for change. Now, I want you to consider this a checklist. Okay, how ready are you for change when you're about to undergo a change, some kind of a change management initiative? If I had a scale on here of one to 10, let's just say there was a scale of one to 10, where one is not at all and 10 is entirely. Resourcefulness, how resourceful of, are you? How would you rate yourself in resourcefulness? Being able to find ways to get things done that seem impossible to get done or that seem unrealistic, right? Where would you put yourself on resourcefulness? Where would you put yourself on optimism, right? Being positive instead of always negative or critical or doubtful or, right? On a scale of one to 10, where would you put yourself? On a scale of adventurousness, Right? I think leaders, particularly in the face of change, have to be adventurous. Why? Because you don't know what you're getting into. Right? If you knew it, it would be easy. Sometimes when you, when you undergo change, you don't know what's going to happen on the other side. And so you have to be even, you know, number five, adaptable and say, well, this isn't how I thought it was going to go, but I'm adaptable enough to say, let's switch mid-course. Okay, obviously, how passionate are you about what you're going to change? You know, many of you have heard me say so many times, enthusiasm is caught, not taught. You can't teach people to be enthusiastic. They catch it from you. And if you're not enthusiastic, you're not the right change leader. Uh, confidence, how confident are you in your ability to create change? And how tolerant are you of ambiguity? Because that's really what change is. It's ambiguous. It's like, you know, it's this thing that we don't know what's going to happen, where it's going to go, how it's going to happen. Uh, you know, where is this going to take us? So if you were to rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10 on each one of these seven things, um, you would, you know, the best score would be a 70, right? Which would mean, wow, you're ready to lead change. But think about if you add up what your scores are and you were really honest, right? What would they be? And I'm not going to ask you to say what they would be. You know what they are. And those areas where you were less than, you know, much less than 10, you have to say, well, then I have to work on that. Okay. And that's why I want you to have this deck so that you can go back and you can look and you can say, all right, where are the areas that I need to work on? So you can see that so much of what I'm talking about, I've been, we've been talking now for, you know, over 40 minutes or 50, well, 52 minutes, if you include the introduction, um, it's all about you. And that's why I keep going back to seismic change begins with you. And so I'm not here to just tell you how do you create change? Because first you have to do all these things. Okay, now many of you have seen this before. I know you've seen this. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But this is the leadership versus management chart from John Cotter. And, you know, I'm just a huge fan of John Cotter. You know, if you haven't read John Cotter's books, you have to read John Cotter's books. He wrote, uh, as a matter of fact, I have it. I have this one on my desk, which is, oh, I see this one, The Heart of Change. Okay, he wrote A Force for Change. Uh, and he wrote how leadership differs from management. He's also got a lot of um, uh, articles, Harvard Business Review articles. And I have to tell you the truth. Sometimes the articles are just as good as the books. And I have a few of those articles. If any of you would like them, just email me. You know, email me at uh, Dr. Lois Frankel at drloisfrankel.com. And I'm happy to share with you whatever I have. Okay. So what John Cotter says, though, with leadership versus management is now look on the left side of the chart. Those are the four basic behaviors that you engage in as a manager, as a vice president, you know, depending on what your title is, as a director, as you could be the, the leader of volunteers. I don't care what your title is. 
those four things on the left are the behaviors in which you must engage. And that is about creating an agenda, developing a human network to achieve the agenda, executing the agenda, and producing outcomes. At its very simplest, that's what you do. But when you have your management hat on, okay, and again, I don't care what your title is. When you have your management hat on, you achieve those four things by planning and budgeting, organizing and staffing, problem solving, and you predict and, and creating predictable and orderly results. Okay, so the example here might be at the beginning of the year, and, and I know every organization does this, they have you create your strategic plan for the year, right? And that plan might be that we are going to serve 17% um, more customers than we did in the past, th than we did last year, 17% more customers, right? Well, in order to do that, you have to plan and budget. How am I going to do this? How much money is it going to cost to do it? Who do I need to do it, right? So you manage the function. But if you look at leadership, look at leadership. You do those exact same things. If you're going to increase the uh, um, uh, customers by 17%, with your leadership cap on, you have to establish direction. So it's not just a matter of, okay, our direction is 17% increase in customer participation, right? That's not a vision, right? That's a goal. That's not a direction. The direction is, how am I going to get to that? That's the end product, right? That's the, it's predictable and it's orderly, but how am I going to get there? So you have to establish direction. You have to align people behind that direction. It's not, you know, if as a manager, you're, man you're organizing and staffing, as a leader, you're getting people to buy into the direction. You're getting them to contribute to that direction. All right, and I wanna give you an example here. A number of years ago, I was coaching, he was the vice president of, I don't remember who he was the vice president of, to tell you the truth, but he, it was at um, a pharmaceutical company. And he said, every time I meet with my team and I tell them what I want them to do to achieve the goals, they give me pushback, right? And I said, well, you hired people who are really smart and really capable and they're giving you pushback because either they don't agree or they have a better way of doing it. And he said, I just want them to do it. That's what a manager would say, right? He couldn't figure out why people wouldn't just do what, they to what he told them to do. And that's because top-down leadership is dead. So I talked to him about all these things on the right. I said, instead of talking to them about what you want them to do, why don't you tell them that, hey, listen, our charge this year is, I'm going to say in the, in the case of um, pharmaceuticals, uh, is to create one new drug, right? Now you talk to them about, okay, how are we going to do that? You tell me how we're going to do that. And he said, but if I do that and they want to go in a direction that I don't want them to go, then what do I do? And I said, you have to trust people. They're not going to take you in a wrong direction if you provide the overview. You have to trust that people, if you hired them, if they're smart, they're capable, right, and you're overseeing them, they're not going to go in a wrong direction. If the goal is create one new drug, okay, have them come up with a plan for how to do that. And that's how you're going to align people behind you. You can't just tell them what to do. That's how you're going to motivate and inspire them. And as a leader, you create change. You do not create predictable and orderly results. You create change. And I'm going to give you some examples of this in just a second. Okay, I'm going to give you some examples. But this is important for you to know. You cannot manage people. You will never manage people. You manage a project you lead people, you manage the process, 
you lead human beings. Okay, those are two separate things. Do not confuse them. All right. Now, this isn't a leadership class per se, so I'm not going to go into how you do that. Um, but if you haven't taken a leadership class, I think it's important. Oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. I think it's important that you do that. Okay. Now, the next question becomes, though, with this is when do I lead? When do I lead and when do I manage? Okay. Now, that's a combination of complexity and change. Okay, how complex is my organization? And complexity is determined by number of products, number of locations, uh, number of people, right? Uh, number of geographic locations, you know, all that contributes to complexity. Change is just what it sounds like. How much change is going on in my company, in the industry, uh, in my department, in the field? How much change is going on? Those are the two factors that determine how much leadership you should provide and how much management. Now, let's start in the lower left-hand box, okay? The lower left-hand box says low leadership, low management. You'll notice it doesn't say no leadership, no management. It says low leadership, low management. And so if you are in an organization that is not very complex, and there's not a lot of change going on, then you should be providing low leadership and low management. But you know what? I don't think any of you are in this kind of organization, right? I can't think of an organization like this unless you're working at a, 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 a warung, right? Did I say that right? I always get that word, mispronounce it, warung. How do I say that? Anybody? Well, Anybody well, you mean wow. warung? Warung. 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 Okay, warung. warung, right? It, that's the place oh. where there's low change and low complexity, right? Okay. Now let's go to the right hand box. High management, but low leadership. If your organization is very complex, but there's not a lot of change going on, then by definition, you have to be managing. Because remember, you manage the function or you manage the process, right? And so if there's not a lot of change going on, then you need to control the process. But I also know most of you do not work in organizations that are very complex without a lot of change because you know what happens. You know what? I, I'm going to take a guess. And I'm going to say the Postal Service of Indonesia acts, acts like it's very complex, but there's not a lot of change going on. And so it's providing high management and low leadership. And that's why you have so much problem with the postal service. And I know that in Indonesia from experience of sending things there and trying to find it and, you know, all these other things. And it's because they're providing management, but they are not providing leadership. We have the same problem in the United States. Why do you think DHL and Federal Express, why do you think all those companies took the business away from the Postal Service? Because the Postal Service didn't create change when it was necessary. Okay, now let's look in the upper left-hand corner. High change, but low complexity. These organizations are startups. Okay, they're startups. There's nothing to manage, right? Usually in startups, there's ideas and there's people with enthusiasm and excitement and, you know, and things are changing quickly. And if you manage people in that environment, you will not get creativity. And maybe, you know, Metti, going back to what you said about being unrealistic, I think maybe sometimes that's why organizations aren't unrealistic enough is because you don't let people just take the ball and run with it without managing them or, or providing low management. I shouldn't say no management, but low management to creative ideas. Because if you provide management where creativity is needed to create change, you will thwart creativity and all you will get is status quo. 
Okay. And I've seen it happen over and over in organizations where I saw it happen at Arco. Okay. It's a good example. When I worked at Arco, they, um, there was at one point at which they had Arco Solar Industries, okay, which now didn't last for long. And it didn't last for long because Arco did not know how to lead. It knew how to manage. And in any startup organization, you needed more leadership, more creativity, and they didn't foster that. And so the creative minds went somewhere else. Why should I work for someone who's going to manage me when I have great ideas? All right. Now, Similarly, those startups often grow. And as they grow, you have to add in management. And I've seen startups fail because they, everybody kind of went amok, right? They started to grow. They got more employees. They had more locations. They had more products. They had more processes. So they became more complex, and as they became more complex, they didn't add in control. They didn't add in management. And so the organization failed. And so as organizations grow, you need to move to this upper right-hand box of high leadership, high management. And my guess is almost every one of you works in an organization that falls in that upper right-hand box. It's complex and there's a lot of change going on, except for maybe the consultants, okay? Except for maybe the consultants. Let me stop and ask, what do you think? Do you agree? Do you see this happening in your company, in your country? What do you think? I'd like to get your opinions. No more multitasking. I think this is, can I start? Please. No, I... You know, I reflected actually when you uh, explaining about this or elaborating it. Actually, I'm I kind of like you know reflecting in my myself, and 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 I see it, I feel it. I would say, uh, especially during our growth in the last five years, this organization has has growth more than doubled in the last five years, or at least doubled and uh, involve thousands of people. So I, I can see that and, and I can also, well, because we experience that. I have some colleagues here, they can, you know, please just speak up and share. But, but I see the, uh, the management part and also the leadership part. We, we will not be able to do this, I think, if we don't do both. Uh, it's not perfect, okay, it's not, it's not perfect. There are some, Hiccups, there are some challenges, but but I can see how how we have to manage that, especially during the uh, acquisitions. And when you take up like thousands of people into the organization and have to do it within a very short period of time, and uh, you know it's always like that, very <laughs> short of time. And and then, but but I think I think we were successfully enough no disruption to the business but it's not it's not an easy job to do it's actually a very very tough things to do so we have to work as a team and and with some help with the you know from the consultant to help us managing the task but the leadership part has to come from us yes has to come from us from even from before day one, I would say we should, we should be able to, to uh, you know, kind of like uh, radiate that. So people who would like to, well, who's, who is coming to the organization can feel it even before what you call day one. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's, that's part of the success also of that integration process. You're absolutely right. And I am going to talk about that in just a second, that with these acquisitions, what goes wrong from a people standpoint and a leadership standpoint. So you're absolutely right. Thank you, Amre. Thank Anybody you. else before I move on? Okay, let me move on. Let me talk about the mistakes that I see change uh, leaders make. Okay. Number one, you don't act like role models. 
you complain. It's like, hey, look, I don't want to do this either. I don't know why we're doing this. They're just telling us to do this. You don't act like a role model. If you don't act like a role model, people can't follow you. Next, you defend the status quo. Now, there's a certain there's something that's positive about defending the status quo because it makes you ensure you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? You know that saying, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and so there's something about saying, hey, look, you know, here's the good thing about what we're doing. But let's keep the best and then let's see how to make it better. You know, there's that old saying also that good is the enemy of great, that you may be doing good right now, but good is the enemy of great. And if you defend the status quo, then, and that's all you do and say, but it's always worked. This is how we do things around here. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? If that's what you're saying, you're never gonna be able to lead change. If you're risk avoidant, right? If you're afraid of making a mistake, and the fact is, is that you're going to make mistakes. You are going to make mistakes. And that's okay because from those mistakes, you learn and you do things differently. So you can't be risk avoidant and be a change leader. You can't be inarticulate about your business case. You have to articulate to people to communicate. What is the business case for making this change? Too often what happens is people come in and say, we're going to start doing things this way, right? You know, I remember when ARCO went through a series of uh, acquisitions and they'd go in and they'd do what we call ARCOize them, right? All of a sudden they had to follow all of the ARCO rules and regulations and procedures and, and you know, half of those companies failed, because they weren't articulate about the business case. If they had been, they probably wouldn't have even asked them to make many of those changes. So when you are asked to create organizational change, you need to be able to understand what is the business case for this and be able to articulate it. Okay, if you're not flexible, you know, you're not gonna be able to create change. If you're impatient, you're not going to be able to create change because you know what? Change always takes longer than you think it's going to. It always takes longer than you think it's going to or it should. For those of you who are triangles, that's your, that's your biggest challenge right there, being impatient. Okay, trying to be the Lone Ranger, right? I'm in charge of this. Follow me. We're going to create change and we are going to come out the other end better off. No, it's not how change works. You can't be the Lone Ranger. You can't be a hero. It doesn't work in organizations, particularly complex organizations. And the last mistake and the most important mistake is that you ignore the human impact. Change impacts everybody in different ways. And so as soon as you start talking about change, you need to think about the human impact. In his book, The Heart of Change, John Cotter says, the central issue is never strategy, structure, culture, or systems. The core of the matter is always about changing the behavior of people and behavior change happens in highly successful situations by speaking to people's feelings. And that's something that doesn't happen often enough, often enough at leadership levels. Uh, you know, Nico and I were talking about this just before we, before we let everybody in to, from the waiting room, right? That, that a lot of times what happens is that leaders have to always be right, right, Nico? And yeah. they think they have to have all the answers but they're not taking people's feelings into consideration. Do you see that happening, Nico? Yes, indeed, yeah. Okay, all right, so this is the heart of change, people and their feelings. Now, you are always gonna get resistance to change. Okay, now I love this quote from Machiavelli. I've, ha I've known this quote for a long time. And what Machiavelli said, there's nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things.
Because the innovator has for enemies all those people who have done well under the old conditions and only lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new, right? So when you get resistance to change, that's how I want you to think about it. You're going to get resistance from people who do better the way things are. Why change things? They're working. Well, yeah, they're working because it makes life easy for you. You don't have to think, right? You don't have to work overtime. You don't have to, you know, you just get to come to work and put it on autopilot. Of course, those people don't want to change. But people who can see the need for change, you'll only get lukewarm acceptance because they're unsure. And it's up to you to encourage them, right? Now, when you get resistance, it's important to listen to it. I'm not, you know, that's the way that you overcome resistance. Many of you who have been in my leadership classes, you may remember the exercise I do with the cup of water, where I, where I take somebody who has a full cup of water, and then I take my cup of water and I pour it into theirs and it overflows. Well, that's what happens for people. When you try to take people who already have a full cup and give them more information and give them more direction and give them more ideas, their cup overflows. You have to let them first empty their cup. And one, and you, they empty the cup by talking, by expressing their um, uh, doubts, by expressing their concerns, their fears. And when you let them do all that, then you can start refilling the cup again, okay? Here's something else to think about. Okay, no, wait, I'm not there yet. All right, so what are the elements of successful change? Let's get through this because I really thought I was only gonna take an hour. I'm already at an hour and 15 minutes. Nico and Gato and Icha, the three coaches, am I okay? You're okay because I mean, it is an interactive, so it is okay because people ask questions and then more questions, which is good. That's what we want. People learn okay. questions also. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the elements of successful change, the first thing is to communicate the need to change. Now, sometimes you have to do this in a very creative way, okay? See, when I talked about the business case, yes, you have to make the business case, but I want you to look at, at these gloves because these gloves represent how one leader did it. In one organization, they talked about the need to change efficiencies that they had to save money, that they had to look at procurement, procurement issues, that they had to, you know, just improve efficiencies in all ways in order to remain competitive. Now that was expressing the business case. Nobody got behind it, all right? Everybody said, yeah, oh yeah, we really have to do this. We have to improve our efficiencies, but nobody did anything. So then what the guy did was he used the example of the gloves that are used throughout the company. What it turned out was that there are 457 different brands and different suppliers of gloves. He got hundreds, I think he got 457 gloves. He brought them to a meeting and he dumped them on the meeting table. And he said, this is what I'm talking about. We need to create efficiencies because we're paying anywhere from a dollar a glove to $10 a glove. And from, you know, 457 different distributors, this isn't working. Then he had people's attention. That communicated in a creative way why improving efficiencies was important. So don't just think about communicating just the business case. How can you make the case graphically for people? How can you get to them to see it in a different way? How can you do this creatively? Okay, so that's number one. No, whoop, number two is get everyone on the same, same team. Now, Amri, this is what you were referring to, okay? Right now, where there are so many acquisitions, right, um, you get these people from different cultures, and they come together. And most companies are smart enough to say, all right, we need to make sure we share common um, values 
a common vision, a common mission, right? So smart companies create all that. And then you get people saying, yeah, we're all on the same team, right? Yeah, we're all on the same team. But then you see things happen like, let's just say in, in company A, it, well, it, within the new company, right? Where there's, you use the number a thousand, Omri, you may acquire a thousand new employees. Within that company, you've got maybe two branches, each with their own heritage. We saw this happen with Arco and BP, didn't we? So they each have their own heritage and, and they all say, yeah, we're on the same team. But then when an opening becomes available for a particular job, the person, I'll just say at Arco, recommends somebody from Arco. And when somebody from BP says, but wait a minute, I've got somebody who's qualified for that job. The person from Arco says, yeah, but I know this person and I know they can get the job done. And the person from BP says, well, I know this person and I know they can get the job done. So despite the fact that you're operating from the same set of values and a mission and a vision, you're not really one team. And so what has to happen to create a high performing team is there has to be brutal honesty. And that's usually what's missing is brutal honesty. People talking about how they feel about the change. What has it done to them personally, right? It's about emptying the cup again. It's about saying, you know, I was really sorry to see some of my teammates, they had to leave, they were laid off because we brought in these other people. And it was really hard for me. And now I feel as if what I wanna do is protect these people that I have. Okay, until you get all that out, you can't move forward with change. So you have to create opportunities for communicate, communicating the change and also for people to communicate how they feel about the change so they can get on the same team. Okay, the next thing is you have to make the mission, the vision meaningful. Whatever the change is you want to um, undertake, it has to be meaningful. You know, I remember when I was at Arco and when I asked one time, what is our vision? They said the vision is to maximize shareholder profits. Our vision is to maximize shareholder profits. You know, that was a little bit too far out for me. I can understand that intellectually but it didn't mean a thing to me. Even though I was a shareholder, it didn't mean a thing to me, okay? Now I want you to take the example of the company that makes, I think this is the C-17 um, jet, right? And the company who makes it, I think it, I think it was Lockheed Martin. I'm not sure, but I think it was Lockheed Martin. And a new CEO came in and said, you know, we need to make this process more efficient. And people said, you know, yeah, we do. And they started doing little things. And he said, that's not enough. And if you know anything about making a jet, the way it works is the jet starts on an assembly line and it goes to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And if a piece is missing at say stage five, they'll move it on to stage six and say, we'll come back and we'll do stage five later. Okay? Now, what that may mean is they may not have that part until the jet is almost entirely put together. And what winds up happening is then you got to take the jet apart. And that is not efficient. So what this new CEO said was that, you know what? We are not going to move the jet forward until all the parts are done in the order they're supposed to be done. And everybody said, well, wait a minute, you know, how are we supposed to do that? That's really going to slow things down. And he said, I want you to figure out how to do it, because that's how we're going to do it from now on. The jet does not move forward. The project does not move forward. It only moves forward in order. Well, then what they did was they got together, the leadership team, and said, well, that means we're going to have to plan better for ordering parts. We're going to have to be more strategic. We're going to have to, absolutely, they had to do all those things. 
And all that came from creating a meaningful vision, not just be more efficient, not just maximize shareholder profits, right? So that's the third step. The fourth step is focusing on buy-in. And that's on that leadership perspective, that's the aligning people behind the vision. How do you motivate and inspire people? There's got to be something in it for them, right? I This, I want you to just take a look at this graphic. I worked with a group uh, at McKinsey and they were the people at McKinsey who create the charts, okay? And I forget, it was the graphics group. Pretty sure it was called the graphics group. But anyway, I was working with the graphics group. I was doing a team building with them. And I said, you know, McKinsey, <coughs> excuse me, if you know anything about McKinsey, what you know is that, I mean, they're premier in the field and they want everything perfect and they can be difficult. Those consultants can be difficult. And the people I worked with were not consultants consultants. Uh, they were not consultants. And they said, you know, well, we have to make sure everything's perfect. And I said, I want you to come up with a graphic that will describe how you are going to do your work. And this team worked together for, you know, a couple of hours, actually. And they finally came up with this graphic. And it's our hearts in your chart. Now, it seems simple, doesn't it? Our hearts in your chart. But for them, it's what allowed them to take pride in what they do. And they communicated it and they got t-shirts with it and they got coffee mugs with it. And it was everybody knew when you came onto that team that you were gonna put your heart and soul into creating a chart that was perfect. It was not just about let's manage and make sure we uh, check everything ahead of time, make sure there's no mistakes. No, they appealed to people's hearts. Number five, remove barriers to action. Hey, look, there are always barriers. They can be financial barriers. They can be, they can be psychological barriers. There's all, they can be people, right, who say, well, they just kind of slow down things. Your job as the change leader is to remove barriers to action. When people start telling you, you know, I'm trying to do this, but this other department over here isn't cooperating, you need to take action. You need to go talk to that other department. You need to see how do I enlist them in a way that enables us to move forward. Your job is to remove barriers so that people can take action. And there's always going to be barriers. We know that there's going to be resistance. Okay. Number six is create short term wins. You can't get from we put together a plane in this way to we're going to do it a new way in one step. You have to create short term wins. Right. OK, so we're not going to do it that way first. But the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a lot, look at all of our purchasing. How do we purchase things? Who do we purchase them from? Are we doing it as cost effectively as we can? So you might break it into little pieces, right? You, you chunk it out. You break it into pieces. So, you know, in the example I give here, so a company might say, well, our big four, Okay, the big four of what we're going to do is we're going to conduct customer focus groups, we're going to identify staffing needs, we're going to train people in new line procedures, and we're going to create communication timeline for vendors, a communication timeline for vendors. You might come up with four things that you're going to do in order to achieve the long-term goal. And it's the first step in achieving the long-term goal because you can't ask somebody who runs sprints to go out and run a marathon the next day. It doesn't work that way. If they're running sprints, first you gotta get them to do maybe a 3K, right? And then you get them to do something more and then something more. There are short-term wins. So you have to make sure you create the short-term wins. Next is maintain a sense of urgency. This is really hard because, you know, a lot of times these change efforts start and then they kind of, all of a sudden, they drop off. You need to create a sense of urgency. And one way to do that is by simplifying things for people. In this particular chart, what you see is if you usually have hundreds of pages that go into a report, you, in reducing barriers, 
may say, I want you to take that information and distill it to two pages a month. I don't want to see a hundred page report. Nobody reads it. It's not important. Um, all I want is two pages about what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, and any challenges you may be having happening. That's how you maintain urgency. In addition to getting rid of the barriers, simplifying things for people. Now, another way that you do this is by enlisting change agents in your organization, right? You may be in charge of it, but let's say, Amri, I'm going to go back to you for a second, and let's just say you have, I'm just going to use, for example, 10 locations, right? At each of those 10 locations, there has to be one person who is a, a, a change champion. And that's exactly what I would call them, a change champion. And then at that location, that change champion enlists 10 more change champions. And they may regularly to talk about what are we doing it how do we how do we do it how do we get rid of barriers this is partly how you also maintain a sense of urgency okay and you have to sustain change don't you you have to make it stick and you make it stick by continually let me see if i have another thing here nope um, by continually communicating about it you make it stick by rewarding people for doing what they're supposed to be doing, by um, acknowledging when things go right, by getting involved and redirecting when things get, go wrong. Too often, you know, and I've seen this happen in organizations all the time, we're going to change this, how we do this over here. But you don't do any of these things I just talked about, right? You do none of them. And then you wonder why change doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because you don't follow the blueprint for change. And the blueprint involves people every step of the way. It's all about people. Let me stop for a second here before I go on and ask any questions or thoughts. I went through that relatively quickly because I want to make sure I get through everything. But but those are the eight steps. And um, any questions? Katot, does anybody have anything in the chat? No, not in the, in the chat, please. Uh, I have a question, yeah. Lois. Yep. Based on my experience before, when we talk about changes, uh, the, first, the first statement that people uh, say is, uh, what is it for me? Ah, uh, right? yeah. Yeah, that, that is what people said. The first, the first sentence that I heard. Okay, exactly. What's in it for me? And that's called the WIFM, isn't it? W-I-F-M. What's yeah. in it for me? And you need to be able to communicate that, what's, what's in it for them. And that's the, pro, that's the part of creating the vision and aligning people behind the vision. So that when that um, scientist, that VP at, at the pharmaceutical company, Mm -hmm. said people weren't doing what he wanted it's because there was nothing in it for them right creating a new a new drug is fine but wait a minute why do i have to do it the way you want me to do it what's in it for you is what i'm going to use every bit of your talent i'm going to use your skills mm -hmm. i'm going to let you get excited about this i'm going to teach you how to be a leader on a project i'm these are all the things that are in it for you. That's how you align people behind and motivate and inspire them. Okay, you're absolutely right. But it goes back to that earlier slide on leadership. That's what leadership is. It's letting people know what's in it for them. And it's always about seeing them as human beings, not human doings, okay. right? human beings, not human doings. They are not. And so you need to be able to assess, you know, it's like the old uh, Jim Collins stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have from good to great. You need to have the right people on the bus, but you need to have the right people in the right seats on the bus. And that's part of what's in it for them is that, yeah, I get to be on the bus, but I also get to be in a seat where I can really look out the window. I can see everything I want to see, right? Yeah. Where it's exciting. Um, and so that's that's part of that leadership, uh, Icha. Did that explain that? 
Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> yes. You know what? Uh, I, yeah. Yes. Is it Imran? Yes. Good morning. Yes. Good Louis. morning, Imran. It's nice to see you. Nice to meet you as always. Good morning, Bapak Bapak and Ibu. It's uh, my pleasure to have a port opportunity to join this session. So, Luis, I'm interested in the your number four uh, item points. Yeah, I think I want to share with you of the my experience in the current uh, situation. I think one of the key important is also engagement. In fact, I this engagement. Uh, for me, is basically is everything, yeah. And I try to, to to find the definition of this engagement. What does it mean? In fact, so I try to find some theory, and I found one of the good theory, which is from the psychology, which is uh, from Khan. This is the expert name, 1990. So based on the is engagement, there are three. Uh, he classify into three types of the engagement, three stages. The first is physical. This is the Basically, the first contact between me and you, yeah, and this is like the first time to know uh, between uh, between us. This is a high, uh, high level engagement. Yeah, we start to build the trust, uh, to build this sa uh, feeling safe uh, when we talk, when we have a conversation with, with the person, to build the confidence. Uh, the second stage is the cognitive, the, uh, he call it. Yeah. So first physical, second cognitive. This is more than physical, deeper engagement. Uh, we uh, become or having a more understanding on the person that we talk to or we have a conversation. We understand his or her value as, and also vice versa. So we already basically understand each other in terms of the objective, the value, and what does it what what is important for each? Yeah. So in this case, the level of confidence become increased. Yeah. The third stage, which is the, 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 the highest case, is the emotional. Uh, this is the, the top uh, level of the engagement, emotional. Uh, this in this level, you basically have sense of belonging. Sometimes you become protective, but in the good in the good way. Uh, ownership, you have a full ownership. It's uh, trust each other. As you know, trust is earned. Eh? You, you cannot get, gain trust within a night. You have to go through the process until you get trust from others, from somebody else. And finally, you, you, you feel secure when you work, when you interact with, with someone and become trust and be trusted. So at this level, basically, uh, whatever the the, 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 the the load of the work or the difficult of the problem, uh, we become like uh, helping each other yeah, to, to lift up this burden. And because you have emotional engagement, you have a, what you call it, extra power to, to, to do anything, uh, to, to solve the problem, to, to achieve the, the goals. Yeah. And there is always a, a way out from, 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 the, from the problem. So this is what I call work with the patient. Uh, in your wording, work with, with heart. So patient is the highest form of the commitment. And if you have a team or you have a counterpart that you have an emotional engagement, I think you have in the best situation ever. So that's my, my sharing, uh, Luis. Thank you. Thank you, Imran. You are 100% correct. And getting that emotional engagement, you know, cognitive is one thing, right? Physical is, is another thing. I mean, people show up, that's physical. Cognitive, okay, I may understand it. But that emotional engagement is what's so important and it's what so many leaders miss out on because to create emotional engagement, you have to really listen to people. You have to create a safe environment. You have to care about them. I mean, really care about them. Not pretend you care about them, care about them, right? So there's all these things that go into creating um, engagement. And so I agree with you 100%, Imran. Thank you for sharing that. Um, anybody else before I move on? Okay, let me finish up so that I can take some more questions. 
Okay, so my top tips to you for leading change is number one, identify and overcome your own personal challenges to lar large scale change. We've talked enough about that. Number two, recognize that change efforts are gonna take longer than you anticipate. If you think it's gonna take six months, it's gonna take a year. If you think it's gonna take a year, it's gonna take two years, right? So give yourself plenty of time. Number three, address the human side of change. And that's in essence, I think what uh, Imran is saying as well. When it comes to the human side of change, and as you were talking Imran, I was kind of thinking about this. You know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is known for her model of death and dying, but she also had a model of change, right? And she said, people go from being satisfied, right? Everything's going along fine. And then you tell them they have to change and they deny they have to change. Like, yeah, why do we have to change things around here? Everything's going fine. They resist change. And then once, you, it, it, once you're at the bottom there, that's that place that you've got to engage them, right? And then they go on to explore a little bit, right? So there's some of that may be cognitive, um, but they start exploring. And then they start becoming hopeful about, well, you know what, things might actually get better if I do this. And then from there, you may get their commitment. So look at all the things that have to happen before you ever get to commitment. And if you understand that, you won't let that get in your way of creating change. Look at this, this um, chart. I'm, sure it's, I'm sorry it's not such a good quality, but, but I'm not good at creating charts. So, uh, but this shows you when it comes to change, you have the people who are the early adopters, right? So on the far ends, you've got like 2.5% and 13.5%. Oh, 2.5% are the innovators. Then you have about 13.5% of your people are going to be early adopters. They're going to be like in it, right? Those are the people who have, like those are the people who had cell phones before anybody else had them, right? Uh, particularly maybe uh, Apple cell phones, you know, that did all these things, smartphones. You know, I know I didn't have one for a long time. Oh, I, I even tell the story. I told this story the other day to um, Tom Henschel. I said, you know, I wasn't, I'm not an early adopter. Personally, I am not. And I wasn't on email and I was sending Icha faxes, right? And one day Icha says to me, Lois, you know, what's with these faxes? You got to get on email. It's so much easier. Now, she's an early adopter, right? And I'm kind of a late majority. I, I put myself in that category, late majority. I'm not a laggard, but I'm a late majority. Um, and so, uh, you know, I know how important that is to be able to engage people. And what was in it for me in that case, each was a client at the time. You know, am I going to tell my client that I'm a dinosaur? I don't think so. So sometimes that's what's in it for people. Uh, but then you have the early majority, right? Then you have the late majority and then you got the laggards. And yeah, you got to bring the laggards along. But as long as you have all of these people, which is like 84% of the people working for you or working with you, um, you, you're being pretty good shape. Over communicate. No matter how much you think you've communicated clearly, you probably haven't. You need to talk about change all the time in all kinds of ways. You need to put up posters. You need to make t-shirts. You need to, you know, whatever you do to continue to communicate, what's our vision? Why are we doing this? How are we going to get there? Why your part in it is important. And as Icha said, what's in it for you? Over communicate when it comes to change. Be honest about what you know and what you don't know. It may be you don't have all the information yet, but this is as much as I have right now. And as soon as I have more, you'll be the first to know. Be clear about what you want. Be focused on deliverables. Be open to feedback and feelings. Be the change you wish to see. That's modeling the way. Create communication channels for people to talk about this stuff. Right? Don't, don't expect that they're just going to always come to you. Create the channels to do it, whether it's through coaching sessions, through these change champions, through focus groups, through uh, uh, town halls. And when you think you've communicated enough, communicate more. 
remember what you measure is what you get. This is true for all behavior. What you measure is what you get. So here are some examples, I'm not gonna go over all of them, of employee engagement metrics, right? You can use any one of these to measure how are we doing in our change. And again, you will get this in the deck. Okay, project performance metrics, here are some other examples. And finally, I wanna say, be an emotionally intelligent change leader. I said at the top of this, emotional intelligence is more important in a leader, or EQ is more important than IQ, right? But a lot of people don't really understand what EQ is. Now, I know there are a lot of models for this. This just happens to be the one that I like. Okay, I like this one because it makes sense to me. And maybe it'll make sense to you. And it says there are five elements of emotional intelligence. And the first one is self-awareness. Being able to see myself as other people see me. And in order to do that, you need to be getting feedback about yourself all the time. You need to be walking around and asking, tell me how I can help you more. Tell me what's working. Tell me what we could be doing differently. You need to have self-awareness and see yourself as others see you. Number, that's number one in emotional intelligence. Emotionally intelligent people see themselves as others see them. Number two is self-regulation. Being able to regulate your moods. Not be Did somebody say something? No. Okay. Um, being able to regulate your moods, being able to, um, you know, come to work, even when you might be a little down and be positive, right? Uh, not come to work and take out what's happening at home on your employees, regulating your emotions. Number three is self-motivation. You know, emotionally intelligent change leaders don't need anybody to tell them, to keep doing it, to what to do, when to do it, why to do it, how to do it. Once they get the big picture, they are motivated to go out and do it. They don't require a high level of supervision around it. Number four is empathy, right? And that's, it's what we've been talking about. It's that ability to say, hey, look, I know people are going to have a hard time with this. I need to be able to put myself in their shoes. I need to be able to feel what they're feeling and let them talk to me about it. And the fifth element of, and there should be a five there, of emotional intelligence is social skills. The ability to talk to anybody in the organization, people above you, people below you, people who are peers with you, outside vendors, the people who sweep the floor, right? The people who come in and provide you with the coffee. I don't care who it is. You should be building relationships and being social with every single one of them. And those are the five elements of emotional intelligence. And as I said, I, I know that the three coaches focus on this, so I'm not gonna focus on it a whole lot more. I'm just gonna ask, you know, uh, Gatot or Nico or Icha, do you have anything to add to this? Well, basically, uh, Lois, actually we are launching a new product. We call it EQ Leadership. And it consists of uh, three things. The first thing is some people, some model mentioned about the three dimensional leader. That means the first one is the business acumen. And then the second one is the personal effectiveness. And the third one is the leadership, which we will focus on the EQ leadership. So we will try to get this uh, move uh, on the uh, on this next next month. I mean, I mean, by 13th of April, we are ready to get this uh, uh, in this form of training or coaching in this uh, sort of EQ leadership. That's what okay. I, yeah. I think that's great because it is so, you know, it is so important. I've just seen departments and organizations fail because they don't have emotionally intelligent leaders. Look at the United States. We had somebody who was not emotionally intelligent for four years and you could see what happened in this country, right? Uh, okay and, I, and i'm you know i'm the biggest one to say i'm the first one to say that out loud okay i'm going to end with a change in behavior begins with a change in heart 
It's a change in your heart. It's a change in the heart of your followers, change in the heart of your constituents, the people that you do business with. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to open it up for questions, comments, thoughts. Yeah. Please Tell brief me. question. Anyone for a brief question because we are approaching to 11. I know. Are you all falling asleep already? No. Oh, <laughs> no, no. No. I, I think no, it's no. I have a question. I am. Okay. I am trying. Sonia? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So um, my question is, uh, you know, the challenge with all this uh, leadership uh, change, um, especially in my group, is uh, on the demography of um, uh, the employees, right? I mean, uh, it's very good if we have a common demography, as in if they are relatively of the same age and they are more open to change. But if there are parts of them that are somewhat, you know, just waiting for their retirement, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not so much of a change of hearts, I think. It's more of um, whether they're even willing to do it, right? I mean, if they're just thinking like, oh, I only have uh, two or three more years to go, then um, I guess my question is how, how should we um, approach or uh, motivate and bring the change to this, uh, to this group of people? Great question. And I think there's a couple ways you can do that. Number one, I wrote an article a number of years ago, and it's, um, it, I can't remember the exact title, but I'd be happy to send it to you. And you can share it with some of those employees. And it's how to make the most of your final five. That if you're in the final five years of your employment, how can you make the most of it? Because you have experience, you can take more risks, um, there's, you know, there's things that people need from you. And so it's about engaging people, Sonia, on that level. It may no longer be that if they're an engineer that I so much need their engineering capability, but maybe I need them to mentor younger engineers. Maybe I need them to tell me what's wrong with our engineering process because they don't have as much to risk as the younger employees. So they may be, if you create a safe environment for them, they may be willing to um, talk more about what's going wrong and their recommendations. So I would enlist them in that way. And again, I'm happy to send you this article. Just email me at drloisfrankel at drloisfrankel.com and um, just tell me that you want that article. Then the other thing is, you know, there was a, there was a famous coach here in the United States. And he said, if you have a team of five people and you're trying to create change, right? You're, it's like that chart. Right, a little bit like that chart that showed you, you have the innovators, you have the early adopters, right? And then you have the laggards. Now, if you're telling me those people are the laggards over here, what the, this coach said was ignore them, right? It's a case of benign neglect. Don't let them get in your way, but do not let them um, stop you from achieving what has to be stopped, what has to be achieved. So my thing is, how do I engage them on their level? Right? They may not see what needs to be changed. They may feel like they're, you know, I call that on the job retired, right? When they come to work every day and they collect a paycheck, but they're not doing much for it. Right? So I need to engage them on their level and I need to have them see what I need them to do. And you may need to give them assignments around this. You may say you've been here for a long time. I want you to be the change champion in your department because you can see what needs to be done. So those are the two things I'd say. Either you engage them in much the same way that it was Imran suggested or you ignore them. And it's a case of benign neglect and there's not much in between. Make sense? Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Louis, yeah. Louis there, there's a, a question on the chat uh, yeah, from, from Michael Laru. It's about how uh, culture is involved in this change. Uh, Michael, I think you might elaborate that. Yeah, Michael, would you please? Is it Michelle? Yeah. Michelle? Yeah, Michelle, yes. We met already, right? Thank you. Thank uh, you, Rini. 
Yes, as, as an intercultural coach and trainer, I tend to see the cultural dimension, which are in various models. And I, as a Western European, which is culturally it, midway between the United States and Asia, I can, in a way, recognize some American values and habits and process that you're promoting quite uh, with a lot of experience. Uh, and I'm wondering uh, how our Indonesian colleague are perceiving that and are there uh, difficulty, potential difficulties, or even potential conflict between their own values and the values that you're promoting. So it's both for you and for uh, uh, Indonesian leaders that we have here. Thank you. Great, great question. And the question he's posing is really to you, to the nationals: is you know where do you see the cultural either disconnects or connects with what I've talked about mm -hmm. it, with the Indonesian culture. I mean, I have some thoughts, but I don't want to share them yet. I want to hear from other people first. I think Nico has some thoughts. Okay, uh, okay bye Nico, yeah. Go ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead, please. Uh, okay, thanks, Nico. Uh, thank you for, sorry, Icha. Okay. Icha can, can I no. ask a question? Go please. ahead, Rini. Um, uh, this is just based on my personal view from experience. I think all uh, the things that uh, Lois brought uh, about just now, um, uh, my, uh, based on my experience, I noticed, uh, works quite all right in our culture, in the Iklim uh, Budaya Indonesia. Yeah? What the only difference perhaps is only the way we communicate. My experience shows that we just need to communicate the way our audience should communicate. So if I were to align people who are mostly Indonesians, um, you know, who have been on the field for quite some time, maybe people from the BUMN uh, uh, culture, yeah, government uh, institutions, then we just need to communicate using their way of communication. But all the other um, uh, approaches I think would apply. That's just what my experience shows. Whereas on the other hand, if I work for a, a corporate um, institution where they're very comfortable um, communicating using more direct Western style, then we adjust it to their way of Western direct communication styles. That, and that's what my experience shows. Maybe other, other people have other input, please. Glenn? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, Glenn? Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Luis. Um, Hi, Glenn. Uh, I don't know where you are in the background, but I want to be there. Uh, that's my property in, in Bali. Uh, greeting from Bali, Luis. Uh, I'll be there soon. <laughs> okay, just let me know. <laughs> right. Um, uh, as you know, that um, uh, we are heading, um, facing this uh, current, uh, current situation. And then I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that um, uh, I'm getting. I'm having this uh, uh, session with you, and also uh, I, I uh, follow all of your slides one by one. And then uh, one thing that I want to ask you is it's about that. If you ask all of us here is readiness for change, how we can, um, the question is, is that uh, during this uh, current situation, how we can survive change um, uh, if we didn't ask for, you know that um, we are now, having this uh, uh, pandemic situation. And then you probably also heard that because especially because I'm working in the hospitality industry, all the change that you are uh, sharing with us, um, um, uh, it's, it's become like a, you know, um, uh, uh, additional value uh, for especially me because I'm, I'm, I'm leading one of the uh, villa resort in Bali. So um, I just want to ask your, your opinion about that. Uh, if you are talking about all of this uh, readiness uh, for change, uh, I mean, from my point of view now, we are now trying to survive. Um, uh, so how, what is your opinion regarding the, the, the current situation and then how we can survive it? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna answer that question then I'll go back to what Michelle had asked of the group. Um, you know, yes, COVID really thrust change on all of us, didn't it? You know, 
every one of us had something in our lives change somehow. And if you're in hospitality, and if what you're saying is in my industry, we really need to create significant change to survive. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Exactly. Okay, so there's the motivator, right? You know, remember what I said at the at the top of the program, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. So, so in this case, you know, survival depends on it. I think in your case, what you need to do is gather your staff, gather key players, and talk to them about what are the challenges and how are we going to address them in some ways, as Mehdi suggested, in ways that seem unreasonable in ways that we never thought we'd have to do this before. What do we have to do that we never did before, but that if we don't do it now, we are not going to survive. And there's all kinds of creative things that people are coming up with. I mean, you know, and I don't know your industry, so I can't tell you what those are, but I trust that if you gather the people that you work with and you have a work session with them, and even if you do it on Zoom and you say, here are our challenges, what are we going to do together to survive this? And if you talk to them about, and I want to use every one of your skills, your education, your passion, you, know, you let them know what you want to do. But it's not your problem to solve, Glenn. It may feel as if it's your problem in whatever role you're in, but you can't do it alone. And so that's what I would suggest. Now, in terms of getting ready for it, you have to make sure that you don't, if you're discouraged, you can't let that discouragement leak out. So you need to be talking to maybe other of your peers, maybe other people in hospitality. Uh, maybe you need to be doing best practices, new best practices, but not talking to your staff about your discouragement, about your disappointment, about your fears, but to your peers and to other people who are on the screen right now. You know, this, these are your peers on this screen. They're not in your industry, but I have no doubt that they can help you. Okay. I know it's very hard. Michelle, going back to your question about the um, cultural differences, you know, I, I agree with Rini when she said, you know, we need to communicate in the way that, you know, yeah, our people like to communicate. What I always used to say, and those of you who were in my classes years ago, maybe 30 years ago, if you remember what I used to say is that a lot of leadership is East meets West. Isn't, I mean, I always used to say that it's eat, East meets West, that there's things about the Western culture that are so wonderful for leadership. A lot of what I talked about in change, I think Western, uh, Easterners do better than Westerners. Okay. I look at people like Amri and Nico and Icha and Meti, you know, and uh, Rini. I look at all these people that I know from ye for years. And I know they are good listeners. I know they care about people. I know they bring their heart to everything. Um, and so that's a very Eastern kind of thing. And yet the Western part about being more direct, more active, um, you know, have higher expectations. I've always thought that that, that has to meet East in Indonesia for Indonesia to thrive. And I still believe that, okay? Because I think still sometimes in the Indonesian culture, they allow, um, or you allow, what would it be? You allow past precedent to determine the future, as opposed to saying, you know what? We can do this differently. Yes, we let people save face. And we do that publicly, but in private, I may be more direct about with you about what you need to change and how you need to get on board. So for me, it's about East meets West. I, I don't see it as counter to it. I, I see it as them as compatible. Did anybody else have an answer for Michelle's question? I, I Nico. A, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lois. Uh, Michelle, thank you very much for the, for the good questions about uh, the applicability of this, some of the thing that Lois shared to, to the culture. I think one of the key, one of the key in the context of the Indonesian culture is 
Well, probably the, what, what Rini said, but I would like to elaborate that more. Not only we can have to communicate uh, with, the, with the audience and how they want to be communicated, but the biggest challenge is our culture of silent, being silent. Whether it is going to be like passive reluctance sometimes, that is the difficult thing in Indonesia. It's easy to man manage Indonesian because most of the Indonesians actually put um, the top is responsibility, obedience at the bottom. So the ability to create or to actually stimulate them to speak up is one of the biggest challenges. So in, in, the, in the change of, uh, concept, I, I would apply the facilitative skills in leading change together with the humility. Why do I say that? Because for me, we will, bet, we will get a better decisions and faster buy-in when we actually facilitate people, make people more understand. And also by combining that with humility, we create a safe environment for people to say what they think because they see that the leader is also human and we also made mistakes. So to arrive to a result of change, which is creative or understood and accepted, when we created the change or result, people will understand that more. And most importantly, they will accept it. That's why the facilitation skills combined with the humility is one of the better way in, in leading change. Of course, um, as, as an EQ, but I also believe that uh, when Cotter said, change is leading people, leading their hearts and minds. So again, the, the, our ability to create this open and transparent environment which actually basically encourage people to assess and articulate their own level without being afraid or shameful. That's why they can be open. So by doing that, we actually get a better buy-in process. So that's probably what I actually would like to add, Luis. Thank you. Great, Nico. Okay, Gadot, I'm gonna toss it back to you because we're at time now and yeah. I wanna keep people, and I want Ade Monare to go to bed I don't know where you are, Ade, but I want you to go to bed. She might have already left. And also, you are going to go to bed, also, right? Because soon, it's, it's not quite as late as it is for not quite as late as it is for Ade Manara, though. Yeah, I think uh, I, I need to summarize what we have discussed from uh, from the from nine o'clock this morning, and uh, really glad that uh, you, Lois, uh, have shared to us a lot of things and. To me, this is uh, beyond our expectation because I thought that it's going to be uh, one presentation and then question and answer. In fact, you offered yourself to be interactive, which is much better than what we thought before. So thank you very much, uh, Lois, for this uh, interactive session. And also thank you for all the participants because you all participate. Whenever Lois asks questions, you just interject. So I just need to uh, summarize three uh, important uh, message that I get. Uh, I'm writing it. Uh, I'm writing it when you said. First, it's about preferences, uh, which uh, you started this uh, morning with the uh, four shapes, in which you mentioned that some people or most people actually do not change in terms of preferences, and this is very important to understand ourselves because it will relate with another point. The second, second point that uh, I wrote down here is about eight steps of change in which you mentioned about the importance of leadership, whereby this is uh, uh, very interesting and it's uh, during the question and answer, people are still ask about this and you mentioned that you cannot do it alone. So I still remember when you said about the uh, jet manufacturing that's very important and it's in fact, uh, it relates with what I'm reading now in front of me. There is, I don't know, there is a book, whether or not you have read on uh, yet, yet uh, but 21, uh, 212 degree, the extra degree, which is very good book. And I still have extra copy. If you, Lois, can choose any one of the participants will receive this book in Jakarta, I will send it. <laughs> because I still have extra copy on this. Uh, I mean, and, one of these participants, you'll give one of these participants the book? No, only, only one copy I have. So if oh. you can 
choose only one. <laughs> I don't know who, who who you want to give to. And I oh, I don't know who I could choose either. I'd have to have a number, like pick a number, right? Is anybody's birthday today? Is anybody's birthday today? Tomorrow? This month? Anybody have a birthday in March? My kids' birthday, girls. No, not your kids. It has to, it has to be you. How about this year? How about this year? <laughs> no, everybody has a birthday this year. Nobody birthday. How has a birthday in April? Me. All right. So there you go. Yanni. Yanni. I'm going to send to Yanni then. Uh, this is okay. like a very good book. And it relates to what you said because it has uh, a story about the... Uh, Jan Carlson, which is a long story about moments of truth. Okay, that is the second one. And the third one is the your consistency in stressing the importance of EQ. So that means you mentioned about self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. That's what I can summarize. Maybe Nico or Icha can add uh, some points that I miss. Okay. Uh, I think that's enough. Okay. I just would like to say thank you to Lois. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pleasure. I think uh, <laughs> excellent is your brand, actually, Lois. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Let's give applause to Lois. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. It's really my pleasure. It's nice seeing everybody, too. It's very late in the evening now for you. It's 11. Oh, no, it's nine o'clock. It's nine o'clock at oh, night. Okay. Okay. Okay, everyone. So I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lois. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Rini, Rini, sudah lama. Thank you. Amri, 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 Nanti setelah pensiun kita foto ya. Ya. Tunggu ini ada halaman pertama. Sebentar. Satu, dua, tiga. Oke. Sekarang halaman kedua ya. Sebentar, sebentar. Ayo di onkan ya. Oke. Satu, dua, tiga. Ya. Oke. Thank you. Terima kasih semua. Terima kasih ya. Thank you ya. Thank you. Bye, 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 bye,